All right, we are live. Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and welcome to our second show this week, folks. Uh, I hope everybody's week is going well. We're coming into Labor Day weekend. People are probably starting to wind down their work for the week. Um, you know, hey, it's fun. Folks, we've got a great episode for you today. We're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to kind of explore our bounds with plant medicine here. So we're going to get into a topic that we typically don't get into, but I think it's going to be very fun. Before we get going, of course, you guys probably can't hear me when I talk away from the mic. Let me get this over here. I really need a producer. Um, this episode is brought to you by Contempo Specialty Packaging. You guys know at this point, you've heard me talk about them time and time again, especially now that I am actually in the cannabis industry. I'm putting product on shelves. I'm very starting to get intimately knowledgeable with the packaging offerings out there. I got to tell you, Contempo has great offerings. If you look at a lot of the cannabis, especially in the early days, there are tons of layers between you and your product. There's a ton of waste. We're not using the right materials. We're using a ton of plastic and it needs to change. That's where you have people like Contempo that have their offerings made of 100% hemp folks. You see it right there, 100% hemp boxes. We've got beautiful eighth jars. We've got pre-roll packs. We've got cartridge packs. We've got these disposable cartridges cartridge packs, I, you know, so whatever you need, we got Mylar bags, anything that you need, Contempo has it and they have it beautiful. On top of that, they're probably going to give you some great advice on your packaging because they come from a 40 year packaging background, servicing the top brands, brands in the world of fashion. And have been working in the cannabis space for over four years with some of the largest brands in the cannabis industry. So if you're looking for beautiful child resistant packaging made from 100% hemp or any of these other awesome offerings like the pre-roll tins or the cartridge tins, or I really do love these HRs. I'm telling you, like everybody who has seen these on my desk are like, ooh, what is that? So, you know, literally, if you want to sell your brand, just put it in this particular jar right here. And according to my market research, it's going to sell. So visit contempopackaging.com. That is contempopackaging.com and let them know that I sent you. All right, folks. Like I said, I get my guest back up here. Like I said, today's topic is going to be a little different than others. So this is a conversation that I've had with, with friends, with people. Um, I've had it with my wife. So we, um, my wife is an addiction counselor. And this is a space that we talk about very often because at the end of the day, you know, the way that she was trained to do everything was, was to not use substance and, and to kind of just keep them sober and have them open up their minds and, and figure out what causes them to do that. And I'm grossly generalizing the practice of addiction counseling, right? But at the end of the day, you know, putting them on cannabis or psychedelics or anything else like that is kind of counterintuitive to the process, at least in traditional culture, right? However, after my experiences with cannabis and, and reading business books and everything else, it seems that a lot of these, we'll call them drugs for now, but they're not. I mean, I guess they're drugs in the sense of pharmaceuticals also, but, you know, have this ability of unlocking and getting you to see things from a different perspective. And that's really where I'm curious to understand how these things are being used in medical practice today, in, in therapeutic practice, in, in psychotherapy, and, and all these great things. Because at the end of the day, I think a lot of us suffer from not being able to see from a different perspective and seeing outside of our own walls that we've created for ourselves. And, and we do need something sometimes to help us do that. And that's how we get better or, or move forward or, or develop. So with that being said, we'll lighten the conversation a little bit, and then we'll get into the sick things, thick of things. Please welcome Daniel Goldberg of Palo Santo. Daniel, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being our, our first expert on psychedelics coming, coming to the show. Well, the, the, the beauty of psychedelics is, uh, and, and this is, um, uh, this is, this is the dirty little secret is, is my partner and I have been in it for about four years. And that makes us, that makes us veterans, uh, you know, this from the cannabis industry. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's a long time in psychedelics. Uh, we are, we certainly stand on the shoulders of those that have been in psychedelics for 10, 20, 30 years, uh, before us, even more so. And of course, going back, um, you know, thousands of years in terms of uh, psychedelics use in indigenous uh, cultures. But uh, four years right now in psychedelics is is a long time. Uh, I think we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome being called experts. But the truth is, uh, we are. 
um, in, in a lot of senses. And it's, um, it's been a lot of fun the last four years uh, diving into space and, and, and seeing the, the, rapid, the rapid change. It's interesting, you know, you talk about the imposter syndrome for being called an expert so early on. It's funny, you know, people call me an expert just because I happen to have really smart people on my show. Like, so Ooh. what will happen is someone like you will be on the show and my video is frozen. That's fun. Let's fix that real quick. Yeah. So, and then all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, he knows so much about psychedelics. It's like, no, I was just asking the questions. He was the one answering <laughs> them. Um, but on that note, you know, it, it's an interesting industry to me, like I said, I focus on cannabis in the cannabis space. And that's where my business is. And for me personally, cannabis has kind of helped me with that, that self analysis and that, that mm -hmm. kind of being my own psychotherapist, right? I joke around with, with my, my wife, I said, my weed is a better therapist than you are to me, but that's obviously because I'm married to her. But what it allows me to do is kind of get out of my normal thought process, kind of take a step back and reanalyze a situation that I might have been in and see it from a different angle and be like, oh, man, yeah, you know what? I was wrong there. Shit. Like, obviously, sometimes it's Monday morning quarterbacking it. But because of that, I can see the mistakes that have been in the past and kind of try to correct them as I understand it. And I don't know that psychedelics will do this for people. And it's terrible. I, first of all, anyone in the psychedelic community, I'm going to apologize because it's my first conversation on it. So if I make the horrible puns that you're sick of or any of the old jokes, no, I'm sorry. It's this all part. There's no, there's no judgment. There's no but, judgment. And uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's about the most non-judgmental. There, there's a lot of, there's a learning curve that's, that's, uh, that's very fast and um, we're all learning and uh, we, we don't, uh, no, don't, don't worry. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Yeah. I, I see I'm bad with that because I'll make I'll, I'll call people out in the cannabis space. I'm like, you're like the 90th person to make that joke. So as I understand it, so psychedelics essentially is that's what it's supposed to do is kind of unlock your brain and allow you to, to access parts or, or memories or things that you weren't able to before paired with psychotherapy. So can you kind of give me a general overview of some of the treatments? I know it's a wide range of some of the treatments that are being done. Yeah, I think I think that's right. That's a it's a good setup. Um, you know, it's, it's funny you talked about you 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 mentioned uh, you know the term drugs. Um, I think working in psychedelics the last four years, I've gotten uh, you know you have to you have to know your audience and you have to meet people where they're at. Certainly, even in even in cannabis. Although now now that you know now that everyone's grandma is taking you know gummies to go to sleep or whatever, it's it's a lot easier. The destigmatization of of cannabis is 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 you know far ahead of psychedelics, but we're catching up pretty quickly. Um, you know, you mentioned the term drugs. Um, you know, I, I'm having, I'm sitting here, you know, drinking a, a highly psychoactive drug, coffee. Um, and and in, in many ways, um, you know, in another time or another culture, another place, or if aliens came down and, and, and we're looking at what we're doing, they would say, wow, this guy's having a really highly psychoactive drug. And you could probably take a small amount of a uh, tiny dose of uh, THC or a tiny dose of mushrooms or LSD and have a lot less of a psychoactive effect than this drug right here. I got very little sleep last night, um, dropped my oldest off to college recently. That's a, that's a psychedelic experience in and of itself. I'm sure. uh, and so, so I'm having coffee to wake up. Um, and I mentioned that because, um, you know, these, these drugs, um, we call, you know, sometimes they're compounds, these, you know, we, we use different, I guess, terms or euphemisms to not say drugs, but they, they are drugs. Um, are being used in um, just a number a, a number of ways. We we you know our fund Palo Santo is invested in twenty almost twenty three twenty four portfolio companies right now um, that are going after a range of of indications. Many of them, most of them, in the mental health uh, for mental health uh, issues because when you're going through the FDA approval process, you have to have an indication to create an FDA approved drug. So you have to say, we're going after treatment resistant depression, we're going after PTSD. So the drug is approved for that. So there are a lot of different ways that these be, these drugs are being used. I, I will, I will, I will say what what's fascinates me is there's, I tell my kids, there's two ways to think about using drugs. One is to escape. Uh, one is to kind of escape uh, you know, kind of escapism, I guess, or, or, you know, getting away from yourself. Um, and, and that can be okay. That can be fun. You know, everyone needs a break. Um, and, and the other is to get more get in touch with yourself and, and, and learn about yourself. And I think that's what you were alluding, you know, that's what you were talking about with, with cannabis. Cannabis can be used that way too, right? It can be used in different ways. 
Uh, psychedelics can be used in a lot of different ways. And I think the more I get into the space and the more um, I see the various applications, the less maybe judgmental I am about how they can be used. Um, so right now we're seeing treatments for everything from depression, PTSD, um, OCD. I mean, they're doing trials for uh, adult autism, um, anorexia, you know, one of the one of the really interesting predicaments in in psychedelics is that because they are um, there is there is such an opportunity to go after so many different indications, we have to be a little careful not to sound like it's a panacea for everything. Um, it's challenging because the more studies that come out and the more we see, the more exciting it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll pause there for a second. No, it's crazy because, you know, it's funny. I talk about that about cannabis a lot on this show, too, where these two substances or these two, you know, calm drugs again together, what cannabis does for the body, psychedelics to me do for the mind, right? So we have that same thing in cannabis where it's like, oh, it helps with upset stomachs. It helps with pain. It helps with inflammation. Mm -hmm. It helps all these different things. And then they're like, well, you're just saying it's a miracle drug. Well, it kind of is, but... Um, you know, the same with psychedelics, if it's going to treat OCD, PTSD, drug addiction, um, you know, depression and things of that nature, and also treat the severe cases that we haven't really been able to crack yet. I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of skeptics, but I'm also of the, of the, of the school of thought where it's, well, if it's not working, why not try something else? Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I saw it firsthand and we'll, we'll start with drug addiction. And I don't, you know, I don't know if you guys are looking into that, but mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, you know, talking to her about it and essentially, you know, a lot of, a lot of the patients that she would work with, you can't get them clean unless they wanted to be clean. Right. They, they had to come to that conclusion themselves. And there was a lot of people there that, that didn't want to, or at least they didn't know that they wanted to yet. Right. And then we have to wait until something bad enough happens to them or a bad experience or they lose somebody or, or they almost lose themselves for them to kind of get to that moment. Whereas if there is a way, and, and I'm granted, I'm sure that they need to be open to it where we can do that sooner and help somebody and realize that they do want to get clean. They don't want to get to the point there. Like, you know, so I see that being an extreme benefit, especially if we can take the 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 sobriety rate from five, ten percent. I know it's extremely low. I don't know what it is, and even make it twenty, thirty percent, and we can just double it. Even though we're not at fifty yet, to me that's a win. And if you're using a substance to do that, but it's being monitored, it's being paired with the right treatments and everything else, then I don't understand why we wouldn't want to go down uh, that kind of rabbit hole. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I agree. Um, it's happening. Uh, there, there are a lot of conversations. There are a lot of statements I could make um, now, or I don't know, opinions, statements, and opinions that I could express that I am much more comfortable uh, saying now about the the application of psychedelics, whether it's for um, you know PTSD or for addiction. I mean, there's some some that we we always you know. First of all, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not directly a researcher. I'm not a researcher. Right. Uh, we all we all are in the sense that if we're if we're if we're experimenting with psychedelics, but I'm not a research. I'm not in this in the scientific community. We are surrounded by the leading um, scientific um, you know, minds in this space, um, you know, at, at our fun. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of CYA talk, which I understand. There's a lot of, well, this has to be, you know, this is a study. We have to see this is a small study. We have to bring it out to a larger sample. And, and that's just how that's what needs to be done now to continue to. Um, uh, you know, gain steam and, and increase the credibility um, and the chances that these drugs are uh, mainstreamed and approved for so that so it's not just people who are, you know, um, I don't know, adventuresome enough to go to Peru for an ayahuasca retreat or who will work with an underground therapist here, which is still for most compounds in most places, you know, obviously illegal. Um, some some compounds, some places not not so illegal, like, you know, Oregon we'll talk about. But um, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm very confident um, that we, we all are that uh, like the application for addiction treatment, addiction's a little farther behind uh, in terms of the data for psychedelics than say PTSD, like PTSD, we can definitively say that, you know, MDMA works to treat PTSD. Why can we say that they're in late stage phase three clinical trials? Uh, MDMA is expected to be approved by the FDA 
you know, within the next, we'll call it like 24 months, we keep pushing it out because COVID, there are some issues with COVID with the clinical trials. It's, yeah. it's like anything else. Supply, it's like the supply chain issues. We got that too with, with COVID. But we're talking about late stage phase three clinical trials for MDMA, which ironically, what's really fascinating there, ironically, MDMA from a, from a drug, a, a, a toxicity standpoint is actually you know that that is a drug that needs to be highly regulated um in terms of how it's being prescribed and used and the dosing is incredibly important there is some neurotoxicity there so it fascinates me and one of the reasons that i got really excited at the first conference i went to for uh, three and a half years ago for psychedelics conference horizons was that if mdma is tracking to be approved which is which is a drug that i i would not recommend uh, you know, to, to my kids to just go and, and try without any kind of, uh, without, without knowing that it's incredibly safe and it's dose right, <clears throat> excuse me, the right set and setting. If MDMA is on that track, think about psilocybin, which is just a few years behind that, or LSD or some of the others. Um, it, it's fascinating. I mean, psilocybin to me, mushrooms, let's call mushrooms for a minute, because mm -hmm. it, it, re it relates a little bit more to cannabis in terms of the culture where i think the cultural acceptance will be because yeah. i've seen this right psilocybin is kind of mushrooms are kind of the darling of the media so, because me, it's so it's natural and it's real so quick safe. Yeah. on that because i want to understand so when when we hear people now that are microdosing mushrooms and things like that is it psilocybin that they're doing or is it another type of mushroom either they're generally talking about psilocybin now what, what's interesting is there are um uh there are, you know, people take uh, legal, what we call functional mushrooms right now, um, which would be like, we have an investment in a, in a portfolio company, Guella, um, which is selling right now what they call, you know, microdose, um, you know, my, you know, microdose, uh, you know, mushrooms, they're, they're not psilocybin until psilocybin is approved. Okay. It, 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 but there's a lot of people, and this is what's fascinating about mushrooms. There are a lot of people taking um regular doses of legal functional mushrooms lion's mane etc you can buy of course paul stamets is a huge um you know a huge um advocate for this and and there are a lot of people taking when they talk about microdosing taking psilocybin for sure and that would be no different than people you know of course um you know using cannabis prior to 10 years ago it's, it's psilocybin is not legal in the united states except for Oregon, which we can get into. Oregon is the first state that is putting together a true legalization. Um, they've, they've passed a legalization measure for psilocybin, magic mushrooms, to be used in conjunction with therapy. Now, that is very different than the decriminalization measures you see across the country. Okay. I just want to differentiate. Decriminalization is basically sending a signal and you saw this in cannabis it's sending a signal to the world that this is coming you know there's something good here it's safe it's legal like we don't want to prosecute people it's it's also ties into of course drug policy reform and social justice in general we should not be arresting anyone for for you know for for carrying around magic mushrooms sure but decriminalization is still far from legalization oregon has legalized the use of mushrooms for therapy and you can't do it today. They're uh, they're writing the rules to it. It's very organized. Um, we'll see how where it goes. But in the next year, say I don't know what the time frame is. I'm I'm assuming around a year. You'll be able to go to Oregon, work with a therapist legally, to um, get treated with, uh, you know, doing a psilocybin assisted therapy uh, thing. Now that gets into uh, that gets into. If, of course, it's the schedule one issue. So that, that is a little bit more like cannabis where you have a state that said we're doing this and that. What, what our fund is focused on is the medicalization process. And so we're, we're invested in companies that are moving uh, you know, a range of, of drugs through the FDA approval process so that you can go to your doctor, go to your psychiatrist, and hopefully use your insurance one day and use these drugs safely to treat a range of of indications it's very interesting to me especially seeing what oregon is doing because i, I remember taking a, a oddly enough a geography class way back in my senior year of college because i needed one more like social science to graduate and i'm like all right i'll take geography how hard could that be 
guy made the, how, the course a little bit harder than it needed to be, but he was very well traveling, knew a lot about the world. And I forget where he was talking about specifically, but I remember maybe it was like Hungary or Budapest or something like that. And they had either decriminalized, I think they not legalized, but they had decriminalized all drugs and they had these safe injection sites and things like that. Yeah. And just that conversation alone, talking about, you know, reducing overdoses and everything else along those lines. I'm like, man, that actually sounds like a good idea. This was before I was even a regular cannabis user where, you know, I was more from the, from the dare generation, you know, as I got older, I got into cannabis and now psychedelics. Not only do I think it's best for just to decriminalize to kind of take away that, that war on poverty and war on that, but also to figure out what the other use cases for these substances are. Right. Um, and, and figure out what we can do with them. Maybe not, you know, crack cocaine and things like that, but with the psychedelics, with cannabis and things of that nature. So it's really interesting now to see, and you know, the first reaction that, that mainstream people have when they see Oregon decriminalize this, like, ah, everyone's just tripping on shrooms in Oregon. It's like, well, maybe some people are, but there is medical purpose behind this. And I think that's always what's cool to drive, drive this forward. Kind of staying in this vein, you, you talked about psilocybin, you had mentioned MDMA. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about production of these, but before we do that, I want to talk about ketamine. Because yeah. there's a, a, a comedian that I, I love, um, and, and he's very popular, Gary Goleman, if people know who he is. He was on Last Comic Standing. I think he's absolutely I'm going to write it down. I, gotta, I don't even have a pen to write down notes. What's his name? Gary Goleman. Gary, G-U-L-M-A-N. Um, okay. This dude is hilarious, but his last special was called The Great Depression because he suffered from depression. And if you listen, I forget whose podcast he was talking on it the most. He talked about it on Kevin Hart's podcast. And then I also think maybe Conan O'Brien and Burke mm. Kreischer. So a mm. few of these podcasts, um, oh crap, I'm frozen. The camera is sucking today, folks. I am sorry about that. But the good thing is you can still hear me. Um, he talks about leveraging ketamine treatment for his depression, mm -hmm. that nothing yeah. else was working. Candidly, I think he said, and I don't know if he was doing this for the humor. It only worked for him for a few days and he went back to being depressed because that's who he is. It might have been just for the bit, but, you know, so, you know, listening to that and listening to him talk about it and kind of talk about the process of going through the treatment and everything else, that kind of, again, that was another kind of milestone for me that opened my eyes was like, okay, there's something here, right? And, and for him, he said nothing else was working, but this, maybe if it didn't even work long term, it worked temporarily to make him feel better right. enough. So, you know, I'm curious to get your take on, on ketamine because obviously I'm yeah. hearing it from a comedian. There's jokes peppered in there. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. what progress is being made in, in this department? A, a ton, a ton. It's ketamine's fascinating. Um, uh, admittedly, ketamine is, is when I first got into this, uh, <clears throat> what was about three and a half years ago, um, I, I, I started with, with, with other compounds. I, I didn't even think about ketamine. I, I maybe read a little bit about it. <clears throat> I think... I, quite frankly, I think I had a, a little bit of a natural bias against it before I got into the business of psychedelics. Uh, and before I, I, you know, we got into really heavy duty, you know, research, and we brought in uh, a, an amazing team of advisors. Prior, prior to diving into to our fund, um, and just just looking at it from a personal perspective, I think I was a little dismissive of ketamine, uh, because uh, it, it, almost because it was this uh, legal like drug that had an off-label use and you know there were some uh, you know ridiculous um, misinformation stereotypes you know people were oh it's a horse tranquilizer it's a you know it's a party drug right you get into these things that are distracting <clears throat> but they play into your, we all have these biases right we just have to continue to 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 focus on the science and and hopefully the science is going to drive the policy as opposed to these ridiculous notions that we have that are based on uh, really nothing uh, now I, I, I wasn't experienced with ketamine. Uh, ketamine's moved a lot in the last year, in the last three, four months, in terms of how how people are using it and where, and, and we can get into that. It, it's a really interesting topic. I wasn't that familiar with ketamine. I had a little bias against it. I kind of thought, is it really a psychedelic? I don't know, you know, it works on different receptors. I mean, I know what MDMA does. Uh, I, knew what, I knew what psilocybin and LSD did. You know, they work on that 5H2A receptor. Um, I knew it was, those were very physiologically incredibly safe. Um, ketamine is, is, it's pretty new that we're using it as a off-label use for depression here widely. Um, I just had a little bias against it. I don't know why. I think it was, uh, maybe it was like, yeah, hey, if it's legal, 
if it's legal, why isn't everyone doing it? You know, it's sort of yeah. like, you know, if it was that good, like, come on, because it's legal. You can go to a clinic tomorrow. Um, and I think there, therein lies the opportunity. It is legal. It is highly effective. Now, there are questions about its long-term efficacy for depression. And I think that's a really good point. Um, mm-hmm. Right now, the, the studies are showing, uh, you know, psilocybin, you know, two psilocybin sessions, certainly MDMA, uh, two sessions. There, are, there is some real long-term efficacy for, for PTSD and depression. Uh, ketamine, we don't, we don't really have that data. There are mental health professionals and psychiatrists that are, that are skeptical on the long-term results. Here's what I'd say about it. Um, uh, I, I, we are seeing incredible, you know, anecdotally, we're seeing incredible results. Uh, from people using ketamine uh, in various contexts for various um, issues, right? And and depression is is a big one. I have come into contact with I don't know at least a dozen people that have had serious debilitating depression. Uh, we're talking about you know really serious major depressive disorder. Um, some that uh, you know really not barely functional that did a two week ketamine session in clinics. Uh, and we'll talk about, there's a big difference between using ketamine in a, in, in a clinic without a therapist and then what we call ketamine assisted therapy, but just using it purely almost as a drug. Um, people have gotten real serious relief and a real boost. Now, you can talk about long-term efficacy all we want. There are people with suicide ideation that are talking to the therapist. Therapist says, go to a ketamine clinic and, and they're, feeling different, right? And they're feeling better. Um, right there, like you mentioned, right there, that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, there are questions. Ketamine hasn't been studied as much in terms of its uh, physiological safety. There are people abusing it that do end up with some bladder. There is a serious issue with bladder. Uh, you know, people are getting, uh, people are dependent on ketamine and using it at home a lot. There's major issues with their bladder later. So we don't, that, that is one drug we want to be a little careful. I think just um, having it sitting around in, in people's homes, it's psilocybin and LSD have a incredibly low toxicity profile, but ketamine is on its way. We have an investment in a company called Journey Clinical and um, Journey, it's, it's, it's really interesting. They are working, they're going to be the first, um, they're going to be the first uh, company that is working with mental health professionals to be able to prescribe. They're going to prescribe, they'll be the prescriber of ketamine lozenges uh, for patients working with their mental health professionals. So right now you can go to a clinic, that's about it, or you can find someone, there are a few people working with ketamine practitioners, they're finding ways to, to, to get it legally through a prescriber, but it's hard. It's not the standard of care, so it's hard for a psychiatrist to just prescribe ketamine. But Journey Clinical is gonna work as the prescriber. So if you um, are working with your therapist, and you say, hey, I want to try ketamine-assisted therapy. Your therapist can train up in a short amount of time to do a ketamine treatment with you. And I think that's going to change things because when people start to go to their current providers and say, hey, I've heard about this. I was listening to, you know, I was listening to like Daniel and, and Todd on this, on this podcast. I heard about ketamine. How do I do it? Clinics are fantastic. They can be a little expensive depending on, you know, where you're going. Uh, but working with your own provider I think that's that can be an amazing solution. That's how I got started um, with ketamine. I, I had a session a year and a half ago, and I will tell you, uh, it changed my mind about ketamine. It was truly, um, uh, it, it provided a shift. It was a big experience, bigger than I thought, and uh, it was fantastic. And, and since then, did a lot of homework, a lot of investigation. Um, I'll just mention one other thing. Ketamine also is... Uh, is being explored for pain management. Um, whether you call that a mental health issue or not, I'll let you decide. When people are in pain for a long amount of, you know, high amount of time, there's a, there, you know, there's a very strong correlation between pain and mental health. Yeah. And we have another uh, company, Bexin Biomedical, that has a, a essentially a, a, a device. It's almost like an insulin pump that can that will administer small amounts of ketamine. These are non uh, psychedelic, you know, very uh, almost subperceptible uh, amounts of ketamine um, for pain management, and and that they're looking to market that to be somewhere right in between Tylenol and Vicodin, right? So right now we don't have a lot of pain medication. Yeah. You, you you go home, they give you a bottle of Vicodin, or God forbid OxyContin nowadays, whatever. I don't know if they're still selling it, but you know, and 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 of course we know the problems there. Uh, and then you have what Tylenol on the other end is very maybe you got some in between. There's tramadol or something. 
But if we can have ketamine available for that, I think it's going to be a game changer. I'll pause. I'm, I'm sure I'm talking to your ear. No, no, you're good. You, and it, it's interesting you say that the, the link between pain and mental health. I mean, I don't think people realize like stupid little things. Like just for example, yesterday I was eating a chicken wing and burned the shit out of the roof of my mouth. Like, you know, like dead skin hanging, everything else, that kind of burn. And <laughs> I legit just like for the rest of the day, like no, I wasn't depressed, but like, you know, I was like, my mouth hurt. I didn't want, I, was, I wasn't hungry. I didn't want to eat anything. Like I didn't have the same energy that I had before just because my freaking mouth hurt. So, you know, someone who's dealing with constant pain, chronic pain and all that stuff, I can absolutely imagine that that would easily affect their mental health. So you talk about ketamine and you said there's a lot of, of disputes with the long-term efficacy of it and everything else, and that it may not do as well as psilocybin long-term and all that kind of stuff. I'm curious to know, you know, is it still something that, that your industry wants to push forward because it oh, can yeah. drive, it will drive everything else and drag it behind it. So like for us, Delta 8 THC, when those products came out, I was, I had a start stance against them. I'm like, I don't like it. I feel like people are trying to skirt the rules. And then um, David, the CEO of Greenpoint Research, came on the show and he's like, well, listen, what are your thoughts if Delta 8 was able to drive the federal legalization of, you know, full spectrum cannabis? And I'm like, well, I never thought of it that way, right? Mm -hmm. Where it may not be something that I truly believe in or think. I mean, I think long term there is it's low THC weed and then that has a huge place in, in society. But for me, if it's going to drive the conversation and drive the process of federal legalization, then I'll, I'll support it a lot more. So I'm wondering the cost of ketamine status in the world, is that kind of your, your leading horse in the race where that's going to drive mm. everything else or is it is still separate? No, not so much. I, 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 first of all, I really, I really believe in ketamine for, there's a lot of, uh, I think, I think it, it's going to be highly efficacious for, uh, for a range of indications. So I, I, I wouldn't say um, I'm not really skeptical around it's like, there is some skepticism around it's long-term efficacy only because the, the studies ha aren't out there and you have Got to, it. you have to sort of separate what we're talking about. If it's, if it's like major depressive disorder, you know, if you're talking about major depression, it, you know, it may or may not be efficacious for that long term, but it may be efficacious for say alcohol use disorder. You know, now we're, you know, alcohol, what we used to call alcoholism is, is being, you probably know from, from your wife is being, you know, kind of um, called alcohol use disorder, which I think is appropriate. Um, so, you know, it will have, here's what I would say. The, the medical, here's what's really interesting. The medicalization, the world of medicalization, right, is we are forced to, um, I guess, pathologize, right, in a way, right? What do you have? What's the problem? And let's mm -hmm. treat that problem. I have major depressive disorder. I'm bipolar. I have, I'm uh, alcohol use disorder. That, that can be very useful. Uh, it can be, I think it can be very harmful too, because you're forced to say, well, is ketamine, does ketamine work? Well, what are we talking about? Is it for this, for this, for this? Sometimes you're in between. Sometimes you're in a gray area, right? I think psychedelics are really amazing because they, they can um, benefit people in so many different ways, right? Our mental health is really along a spectrum, right? Even if we're considered well people, um, we all have a certain level of, of something, neuroses, a little OCD, right? I mean, not OCD. We're, is, we're, we're all mad not. in here. We're all freaking crazy. So what, what I find interesting is like, you know, is ketamine have long-term efficacy? Well, for what? Um, Maybe it does or doesn't for major depressive disorder. We're going to find out. But what we're learning is it's 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 working for uh, people in a lot of different ways and helping them. The the common denominator, I believe, in a lot of of, of mental health issues is this concept of rumination, right? And there's this there's this um you know there's this this concept that your default mode network, right? That this neural network is basically can experience a reset uh, with psychedelics. Um, and, and this is, this is, this is science. This is a reason why, you know, Harvard, you know, Mass, Harvard's Mass General Hospital just opened a new psychedelic science center by Johns Hopkins studying it because the neuroscience is really, really coming along. And I, I can tell you from my own ketamine experience and from others that if with a, with a high dose and the right conditions, you experience this reset that is very, uh, psychedelic. So, you know, did I have a major depressive disorder? No. Uh, was, was I, was I, I don't know, experience a certain level of stuckness or, or rumination or, I don't know, neuroses or, you know, in, in, in middle age and super busy and crazy with business. Sure. 
like everyone else. Did ketamine help that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one or two experiences over a year was extremely helpful. So, um, no, I don't, I think ketamine stands on its own. I actually think what you're saying is true about psilocybin. I think psilocybin, I think mushrooms are going to really help with the cultural acceptance. I think mm -hmm. mushrooms feel uh, a lot like cannabis to people because they're natural. Uh, first of all, the tech, they have the lowest toxicity. There's no known real toxicity for mushrooms. Did you know that mushrooms are the, uh, it's the only drug that we know of that has no known lethal dose. You can have hmm. 20 bags of mushrooms and you will be fine. You, you can, you can go to a, have your kids can have a party in the basement, high school kids. And, you know, you know, and you know what happens when, when somebody's, you know, has, a, has too much alcohol, um, they can die. And, and hmm. you know, tell my kids all the time, if you, if you see someone like this with this amount of, uh, alcohol going in their system and they're out cold, call, call you know, call 911 because they can die. Wouldn't happen with mushrooms. So I think mushrooms actually are going to be um, the, the Trojan horse in a way um, for acceptance of other psychedelics. And, and you're seeing that with the decriminalization, right? The decriminalization is revolving a lot around mushrooms yeah. and plant medicine. I, I don't distinguish between what we call plant medicine and synthetic. And we can get into that uh, in terms of um, I, I don't judge sort of between the two. Um, I think they're all, they're all a big part of the story, but I think the plant medicine aspect helps, uh, helps destigmatize and there's a cultural acceptance. You can get your mom or your grandma to probably try a little bit of mushrooms by telling them, Hey, it's a mushroom. It's really safe. Take a you nibble. Yeah. Chicken Marcella last night. It's the same thing, you know? Oh, what? What'd you say? <laughs> I said they made chicken marsala last night. Yeah, it's the same yeah, thing. yeah, right, right. Well, and it's so arbitrary, of course, if you get into the how all these things became scheduled. And, you know, we go into that. You you know the, the history there, but the how how and why things became uh, illegal, of course, has there's no connection between the science and the policy, right? I mean, at all. We we understand that now, and you have to you have to you know have that. You have to do a little research. And um, and get people up to speed on the fact that there is zero connection between the science and the policy as it relates to drugs. And if you can start to uh, understand and accept that, um, things start to make a little bit more sense. A hundred percent. No, I, I mean that that happened with me with cannabis, and you start to question everything else. There, I think for me, the only thing this pandemic did was expose that nobody truly knows what the fuck they're doing, and we're all trying to figure it out together. So. This is part of that, right, is things that we said were bad for so long. But I think part of it is is generations of, of kids and people grew up and it was just a non-negotiable. Drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. Yeah. Drugs are bad. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, a new generation came that grew up with the Internet and we had access to all this information. It's like, are drugs that bad? Or is that just what I'm being told? Are there uses for them? And, and now that generation's growing up and going into research and investment and everything else. Yeah. And I think we're starting to see this trend of questioning the, the old world that way, which is really cool. So you had mentioned the difference between plant medicine and synthetic. <clears throat> My question mm -hmm. actually is in, in these clinical trials and, and all these treatments, how are these substances being produced, whether it's MDMA mm. or anything else, because that's a question that nobody talks about in cannabis. And, mm. and I bring it up, right? All of a sudden you have a state that cannabis is illegal. And then all of a sudden they give out say 50 licenses and now mm. 50 people are cultivating cannabis, but they're not allowed to buy those seeds in the black market and they're not allowed to traffic them across state lines. So how do they magically have cannabis to grow? Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about that. So with these treatments, Avi, I don't think, you know, they're going um, down to the cartels and saying, give us the best shit you have. How are the, how are these substances yeah. being produced for this? Yeah, no, our industry, the psychedelics industry is is completely different than than cannabis in, in this way. Um, there are some parallels. I mean, there's no doubt, uh, you know, there are some parallels in the sense that they're both formally, I would say, formally stigmatized substances, right? Because cannabis is certainly, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're in a, if you're in an area, someone's still stigmatizing cannabis, just I don't know what to tell you, like, get, get them up <laughs> to speed. Yeah, just whatever, uh, you know. I, I would almost say I heard someone say just grow up. If you're having a big glass of whiskey and you're on your yeah. third one and you're and you're being judgmental about you know someone having a joint, you just need to like you just I don't know what to tell you. At that point, yeah. you're you're lost. But psychedelics are are on their way to being um, destigmatized. But that's really there's a few parallels with psychedelics and cannabis. That's one of them. The other is that from a business standpoint, it's it's um there it's a little bit of the wild west and we have a lot of investors rushing into the space. Um, there are a lot of investors rushing in 
to psychedelics kind of coming from the cannabis world um, that are, are uh, slightly misguided in the sense that, you know, this is not going to be the next cannabis. This is not a recreational market. There may be some recreational aspect to it and some production of, of psilocybin if uh, mushrooms, if, if, if that progresses, but generally speaking, these are, are psychedelics are going through FDA. Uh, these are F, going to be FDA approved drugs. So what that means is to answer your question, um, like our companies generally are, they're, they're biotech, they're biopharma businesses, right? So if you're working with LSD or um, psilocybin or DMT, uh, or there's some others, um, they get a DEA license to work with those compounds. But they're generally, um, what, we're, what we're really investing in is typically what we call second and third generation molecules, right? Second and third generation psychedelics. So we're working with companies that are, that are, are, are um, creating drugs that are essentially inspired by uh, psilocybin or LSD. And they're not exactly that. They, they may be, there may be analogs. There's a lot of different ways to, uh, to, to, um, to work with these compounds to hopefully make them uh, safer and, you know, more efficacious. And in, 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 in certain cases, uh, they're working with these compounds to make them so that they're not contraindicated with current uh, antidepressants, right? So right now, MD, like MDMA, you don't want to be on too many antidepressants. It may affect it. Uh, whereas if uh, one of our companies, Tactogen, is, is creating like MDMA-like drugs that will hopefully be um, safer and gentler and maybe even take-home versions of MDMA. Now, I mentioned that because you asked how are they produced. Our, our, the companies we're working with, the businesses, um, they're working with, they have DEA licenses to work with psilocybin or LSD if they need to. And there are a few producers, there are scientists, and, and we know them, that produce, um, they're generally very small amounts of these drugs for research that's legal. And then if their drug gets through the FDA process, that is then a legal drug and it gets rescheduled. So mm. Think about something like Ritalin. Think of like Ritalin or whatever the ADD drugs, right? We know that those are safe and legal drugs. We can debate if we over, you know, over prescribe them or whatever. But the bottom line is they're not they're not like crystal meth, right? People yeah. say, well, it's kind of like the same, same combo. No, it's it's been it's been changed uh, quite a bit to get into the safe and legal form. So now now you do hear just to just to you do hear about the production of psilocybin. <clears throat> um, and, and that is a business we're not we're not investing we're not really focusing on the synthesis of these compounds we don't think that at this point we don't really think that there's enough material quite quite frankly um enough of a business to produce these uh actual the actual the, you know to be a producer i think that's going to be a very commoditized business there is a lot going on in canada by the way canada is essentially a great market for psilocybin that's a different hmm. case canada if you live in canada you can go online and you can pretty much buy mushrooms and people are, are are selling them. We're not in that business, that gray market area at all. Um, they're kind of on their own path of of legalization that that maybe will follow. Who knows? Uh, and we'll see where that goes. They have some activists there, really interesting, that are really pushing the limits. Um, maybe they'll maybe they'll win. Uh, they, there is some still cyber production going on in Canada. Um, some of it legal, some of it gray market. That's not the business we're in. We're really in the um, right now in a, in a very sophisticated biotech, biopharma business. Um, and we hope over time that our portfolio is, is, uh, becomes one where we're throughout the entire psychedelic ecosystem, which includes um, education. We're looking at a company right now that's, edu you know, that's involved in, in, in training up therapists because there's, there's a real bottleneck with therapists not knowing how to use Right, how to how to work with these drugs? Mm -hmm. um, we have a retreat center that we're invested in um, in Costa Rica, um, a legal you know retreat center there. So there are and uh, there's I'll mention another um, which is really interesting outside of biotech. We're invested in a company called Wave Paths, which um, is creating generative music. Music is a huge part of the psychedelic experience mm -hmm. to be used in therapy. So there are other investments besides biotech and biopharma, but the vast majority of our portfolio. Is in the is in the development of these drugs, and these drugs will be FDA approved drugs. So in a way, it's very different than like producing cannabis, right? Or you know, that's it, there's not a ton of production going on in in the uh, actual material. So, if that makes any sense? No, a hundred percent. And 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 honestly, I'd love to see cannabis get to a point like that too, where we're starting to 
isolate the major cannabinoids and, and things like that to treat different things and there be more medicalness to it, if you will. Obviously, it's not there, a real word. It's happening. It's happening. We see a lot of that stuff. We're, um, we, we do see a lot of it. And it's a great <clears throat> point. There's this a little bit, I'll mention, there's a little bit internally in psychedelics. Uh, there's, there's this debate between, you know, kind of legalization and medicalization, right? Um, legalization being, uh, you know, psychedelics should just be legal in every state and everyone should be able to do whatever they want to do. Medicalization being, of course, the, the business that we're in of, of investing in, in companies that are producing drugs that we hope will create uh, wide access because I don't know about your family, but you may have an aunt, a cousin or, you know, a friend that has no interest in psychoactive drugs or psychedelics, but they may go to their doctor and say, hey, I have a I have a migraine. Right? Yeah, we're, they're being used for, you know, they're being investigated for migraines, psilocybin. And the doctor says, great, I've got a drug for you. Writes the prescription, use your. Um, insurance. That's the dream is that we can see psychedelics being used in both a medicalized context for the for people that have no interest in in, in being adventuresome, but also uh, also for people that want to, you know, do a, a mushroom trip, you know, at home responsibly. That I, I don't think that they're um, I don't think that those medicalization legalization go against each other at all. It, well, it's interesting when you talk that way and saying, you know, you go to the doctor, you tell them what you have, and then they write you a script, you take it because I think that's the relationship most people have with pharmaceuticals right now. They don't know what the fuck is in. God damn it. I keep freezing. Um, eh. <laughs> um, sorry, folks. It's because we're talking uh, psychedelics. We're talking yeah, psychedelics. Right? Things happen. Crazy things happen when you get um, into psychedelics, man. But people don't know what are in the pharmaceuticals that they're taking. And obviously, we had a huge problem with Oxycontin. We talk about drug addiction mm -hmm. and solving that problem. Oxycontin was some of the things that caused those problems. And that's what a lot of mm -hmm. people are in there for, or painkillers and things of that nature, right? So it's interesting to know, like, when will we get to a point where we might have both cannabis and psychedelics and other things that are just part of the pharmaceutical that you're taking? And, you know, like you said, it might be psilocybin, and it's just called siliplex or something yeah, shit, right? that's what's going to happen and and i think you're right i think it will happen with cannabis eventually we're ironically psychedelics is kind of leapfrogging cannabis now cannabis yeah. is a massive massive industry for obvious reasons um for its adult use recreational market it's a massive industry but in a way psychedelics is leapfrogging uh cannabis in terms of the um in terms of the uh research Right. And the medicalization Our one of our advisors, um, Julie Holland, um, uh, who's very closely connected with with math. She's a she is a, a, a psychiatry practice in New York. Um, she's one of the leading advocates um, for for uh, MDMA and, and other psychedelics. Um, she she would argue um, that cannabis can be a psychedelic. Right. That cannabis is, is, is a psychedelic. Right. What does psychedelic means? I mean, it means essentially mind manifesting. Talk to anyone who's dosed. Uh, to you know, taking taking the wrong amount of an edible, um, and 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 was essentially you know, uh, you know, tripping for lack of a better word. Um, there there are a lot there are a lot of um, there are a lot of properties um, you know in cannabis that, that we we haven't fully understood, uh, and I think that can I think that cannabis will find its way into the into the medicalization route, but it's going to be there's a lot more research that that needs to be done, and they need to. They need to really, um, really understand these these, these cannabinoids and, and how they would fit into treating indications. The problem we have in this this country is that you have to be treating a specific indication and have a drug approved for uh, for that. So you can't just go out and, and make up a cannabis drug and and you know um, and and put it in doctors' hands. But I think we're going to get there. There's just too much anecdotal um, information and now scientific information about how cannabis can be. Um, uh, you know, can, can treat certain indications. Interesting, man. Well, listen, we are getting close to the top of the hour here. I want to make sure that we talk about, you know, anything that is topical because, you know, this is not something that I'm very familiar with. Yeah. You know, when we look at the world of psychedelics, you know, outside of what we just discussed, what should things, what things should people be considering when they view it from the outside folks that want to invest in this space? Clearly, mm -hmm. if you're going to invest in a space, go to some, an expert like Daniel, go through a fund. Mm -hmm. Don't try to do it yourself unless this is what you do for a living. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what should people be aware of or what should they take away about the psychedelic yeah. industry? Yeah. Well, um, there's, it's, 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 we're in inning one, inning two, first of all. Um, I think, you know, like any, I think it's sort of like cannabis where people always think they're too early, they're too late, they're too early, they're too late. Uh, 
you know, we're going to see a real shakeout soon. There is a lot of hype. Uh, valuations are very high uh, for most of the deals out there that people have broad access to. Um, so I'd be very careful. Um, I, I couldn't tell you what, what, what stocks to buy because we don't, we don't do that. We're involved in very early stage, um, sometimes, sometimes preclinical companies with preclinical assets. Um, and we have a team of scientific advisors um, and, and we're in this full time. Uh, so uh, the idea of, I, I can't imagine if you're investing on your own, it would be very tricky. Uh, this, this business is really a biotech, right now a biotech business and there's a lot of science. Uh, so, you know, we, we developed the fund format um, for this specifically because we knew that there are gonna be winners and losers out there um, and that we would need a very diversified portfolio. We, our portfolio is diversified across both, I would say indication and compound. So we look at it as, you know, we, we, have, we have companies that are treating Parkinson's and Alzheimer's as well as depression and, and migraines and, um, and uh, you know, and addiction. Uh, we also look at it and say, we don't want to be too heavy in just psilocybin. We, we have companies that are exploring 5-MeO-DMT, um, uh, which, is, which is, a lot of people know is toad venom, um, as well as ketamine. And um, even some, we're even in clinics that aren't using psychedelics right now, but uh, nation, you know, international um, chain of clinics that, that is looking to, that are using other modalities that are looking to use psychedelics you know, within their, you know, within their clinic soon. So it's a very tricky space. We don't know where the winners are, are going to be. Um, you have to have access to a very broad, uh, a targeted portfolio. You can't have a really broad bet in this space. It has to be targeted, but it has to be very well researched. Valuations are pretty nuts for this the what I'd call the sexier deals out there that people seem to float around at I don't know country clubs or pass around and you know their deals whatever uh, we're seeing stuff typically within we get a lot of deal flow from within the the psychedelic community from researchers at you know Hopkins and 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 Harvard along from you know our scientific advisors we're seeing deal flow that um, where companies want a professional investor in there that can. Uh, that can add value um, in, in a lot of different ways. So uh, my advice would be be very careful. Um, there's 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 a lot of hype, uh, but we are in inning one or two. And if you're with a uh, with someone with a fund that's uh, managing uh, a portfolio professionally, um, I think you're going to do very well. It's 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 a space where um, uh, it's a space where a lot of people are associating just with mental health. But we're going to see psychedelics, especially with some of the anti-inflammatory properties that have been um, discovered. Uh, we're going to see that move into a range of CNS disorders, um, and and I think I personally think everyone who's has a migraine is going to be using mushrooms in five years. That's my that's my bet. You can you can play this back. Uh, you'll have to oh we you know, will do that. So yeah yeah. But so I think you know. Um, you know, it's you know with the risk of sounding too uh, self promotional is is you know i think i think being in the in the fund format is really really key to success here because the it, it, we're going to have some big winners and we're going to see a lot of zeros um and and you need to have a or a true diversified portfolio in this space i agree with that i mean i agree with that in the cannabis space i agree with that in any space if you don't know it don't do it yourself get get someone that can do it for you but Daniel, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I'm sure there's a ton more that we can talk about. We might be able to do that at a later time. But before I let you go, send them to the website, any other pages you want them to see. What's it? Oh, our, um, well, you're welcome to visit um, palosanto.vc. It's P-A-L-O-S-A-N-T-O dot V-C. And you can check out our portfolio and um, sign up for our newsletter. We're, we're uh, getting a newsletter out fairly regularly that is, is not just talking about our own uh, portfolio, but really trying to educate people about what's going on in psychedelics um, generally and, and mental health. So um, we're on a mission to, to hopefully solve the, the mental health crisis that we're in. And um, we, we want to educate uh, as many people as possible. So we appreciate, uh, we appreciate your, uh, your forum and uh, look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. 
Absolutely. Well, we appreciate you and thank you and thank you to everybody at home for watching. Been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Of course, if you missed any part of this episode, you can check it out on YouTube next week at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and like our videos. I need it. I, I am an attention whore and I need the attention. I need the love, <laughs> folks. Give it to me. Um, of course, we are done for the week. I'm going to be out of town next week, so I might do an episode on the road. Probably not because it's really freaking hard to do. So we're going to take a week off most likely, and then we'll be back next week with some amazing guests for you. Stay tuned. Check out our greatest hits on YouTube, and we'll see you next time.